एवरीवन हाउ यू डूइंग आई होप एवरीबडी इज डूइंग वेल सो लॉन्च पैड के अंडर द लाइफ स्किल द जर्नी ये सारे सेशन चल रहे हैं एक्सपर्ट्स आ रहे हैं एंड आज ऐसे एक्सपर्ट के साथ हूँ जो मुझे हमेशा लगता है इजी फॉर रियल सो यू नो वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट मर्चर्स एंड एक्विजिशन एंड वैल्यूएशन एंड मच मोर पता है क्यों मैंने बोला इजी फॉर रियल लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस हिम फर्स्ट सो आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट दर्शन राठौड़ ही इज चार्टेड अकाउंटेंट ही इज ऑल इंडिया रैंकर थ्रू आउट ऑल द लेवल्स इज एम बी ए फाइनेंस एक्सेलराय जमशेदपुर सो ही इज अ होल्डर ऑफ ओ पी जिंदल स्कॉलर फॉर टू थाउजेंड एंड एट ही इज चार्टेड ऑल्टरनेटिव इन्वेस्टमेंट एनालिस्ट सो हीज डन हिज यू नो दिस डिग्री फ्रॉम सी ए आई ए यू एस ए हीज मास्टर्स एंड कॉमर्स सो अलॉन्ग विद एटीन ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस इन द फील्ड ऑफ मर्जिस एंड एक्विजिशन ड्यू डिलीजेंस एंड वैल्यूएशन राधर यू नेम इट हील हैव इट राइट सो डोंट वरी अबाउट दैट वॉट वॉट हिज एरियाज ऑफ एक्सपर्टीज आर इज अ को फाउंडर ऑफ एक्यूमेन it is an mna advisor so he is a partner with woodbridge uh, international from usa prior to acumen he worked with uh, pwc eny and uh, deutsche bank alternative investment uh, you know uh, department he is a registered valuer registered with iibbi for asset class uh, securities for financial assets his sector focus would be business services chemicals printing and packaging hospitality and healthcare he is a charter member of tia global uh, erstwhile go ahead so yeah this is something i really want to talk about you know so he was uh, he was co head of some um, chapter i mean we are going to talk about it that what, what is what is this young indian chapter of confederation of indian industry so at xlri so we are going to talk about it to how about this and then if this was just not enough he is a wit trekker he is a marathoner cyclist regular speaker on topics on mna finance valuation and he is the co-founder of the non movement this is the excellent and uh, you know just so much of i don't know i mean i, I really at times are you for real i mean really you do so many things at 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 such a age kaise kar lete ho so welcome darshan rathod on this platform we really love to have you on such a dynamic um, and versatile experience you bring to the table so you'd like to know more about your life journey how it was how you shape it up how how you became so much into cycling or marathon or trekking or into xlri or all throughout the rank i mean aise kuch daivi kuch shakti kaise how did you manage all of that right <laughs> uh, thank you thank you sailee for the lovely introduction uh, you know now that you were reading about all of this it just makes me suddenly it makes me feel i'm so old uh, although uh, yes uh, there were quite a few things done uh, and you know one interesting message over here is really that uh, in life not everything is very very planned right a lot of things happen and then if somebody tries to look back it seems everything is planned right so um, while it's important to go with the flow uh, i'll just give some background in terms of why i ended up doing so many things right and what's the reason and, and you know it's it's never it's never late to start something or or i would say it's also never early to start something and i'll just give you a perspective why exactly i'm mentioning that as well um so let's start with uh, i i'm sure there'll be a lot of cs students out here right uh, who would uh, like to actually listen to the story and uh, so i had an interesting reason why i became a ca uh, i come from a, a family of uh, uh, marwadis right and uh, in marwadis you typically see people either doing trading or they are in their field of finance right so uh, interestingly my father is a ca uh, himself he has been practicing for the last 35 40 years and uh, my elder brother uh, ended up becoming a computer engineer and then he has actually now uh, specialized into mathematics and he's a scientist so uh, for me i mean the uh, it was less of a choice more of a um, you know uh, you know something somebody had to uh, you know sit through uh, you know the father's practice right and that was the reason why i had to end up doing cs it was not out of a choice very frankly um, and that's where the story started right uh, i was really forced into uh, you know becoming a ca uh, in that aspect um while i was doing ca uh, of course one of the things which you mentioned was about getting an all india ranks uh, throughout right and uh, uh, honestly a, a lot of that credit i would give uh, to two people right uh, two set of people uh, one of course is uh, my family uh, i think they were extremely supportive whenever it came to education and i think that helps and matters a lot uh you know there was utter sincerity in terms of them making sure that i do not get disturbed anywhere 
uh, utter sincerity in terms of ensuring that I uh, have all the uh, the right things, you know, for where I can focus on my uh, education, right? And I think the more important uh, element, uh, you know, in terms of getting through uh, with good marks is also getting through a right set of friends. And I think uh, it matters a lot, especially when you're doing CA uh, in terms of who you hang out with, right? And I was very fortunate that we were, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of about 10 to 12. In fact, Sally, you might be knowing most of them. And we all, uh, we had our share of fun while we were doing CA. But, uh, you know, of course, because we missed college days, right, when we were doing CA. But we also ensured that uh, when it came to came to studies, uh, I think we were extremely serious and focused. And we did have a lot of group sessions. We used to understand a lot of concepts together. And of course, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, collaboration rather than competition whenever we came to uh, becoming C. And I think that that I would rate that as, uh, you know, the, these, two, these two are the top two reasons why, uh, uh, you know, I, I ended up uh, doing uh, C and, you know, in, in with, right, uh, with the right, uh, you know, elements. Uh, and of course, getting through uh, with flying colors, uh, very frankly, that is a third attribute. And that is because of my extreme fear of failure. Uh, so I used to go uh, to the extreme uh, to an extent where, you know, I uh, I will completely uh, completely sacrifice every little element in life, uh, just ensuring that I have to get through, and that was like a one single focus. So uh, so that's really a, these. There's a combination of the three elements, and I th- I think uh, becoming into merit more than an, uh, more than an aim. I think it was just a, a byproduct. We just came out of uh, these three factors. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, then of course, uh, when you do a CA, you always wonder, you know, what do you want to do right after that? Uh, and when I became a CA, I realized that, uh, uh, you know, my father was into tax consulting and he used to work with a lot of individual and small business houses. And I realized that that's uh, something which I e- explored for a while and I realized that's not my cup of tea, right? Uh, I, I felt like I wanted to do something more and my father was very supportive in that aspect. So, uh, so I ended up working with uh, a couple of global consulting firms uh, for about four years. And uh, it definitely gave me an exposure in terms of what are the best practices. But then there were also a few pitfalls, right? In terms of what kind of exposure I was getting, how much real value addition which we are giving to clients. And in that process, uh, Saili, you know, uh, in those three, four years, what I realized was, of course, CA is a very, very important foundation. But I realized that my personality is uh, uh, more on... Uh, I was a very people-oriented person, and uh, that was where another decision of uh, getting doing my MBA because I wanted to expose myself to more, uh, you know, a, a wider range of uh, you know subjects and elements, and that's where I ended up doing my MBA from Excel Jamshedpur, and I think they were one of the the best two years of my life, of course, because I also compensated my lack of uh, you know uh, enjoying college while doing CA, but apart from that, I think. Uh, there were two very specific elements which were very, very critical, uh, you know, which I learned at XLRI. And uh, of course, there are 100 things you learn, right? But some things leave an impact for life, right? And I think that one particular thing was uh, uh, the ability of taking risk. Uh, I started my first uh, entrepreneurship venture when I was in XLRI. And it was, uh, maybe I, I, I missed out uh, uh, updating you about it. So that was my first venture and it failed. And it failed, mis- I failed miserably in that. But what learnings you get out of failure are also something very, very beautiful. I mean, uh, you know, so the, the idea was we were trying to do some handicrafts related uh, online uh, platform for uh, handicrafts. And I think India has a lot of potential. And that was the whole idea of a startup called Parichet. And we did get two rounds of funding to that. And we were very, very aggressively promoting it. We had a lot of designers coming in. Uh, it, I think it was a phenomenal thing. And for XYZ reasons, the, the startup failed. Uh, so one, like I said, entrepreneurship is something which uh, the risk taking ability is something I learned. And number two, I think more importantly, very uh, Sally, what I learned at XLRI was uh, the entire importance of uh, looking at anything what we do in life, not just from a monetary or an economic perspective, but also from a social point of view. And I think these two elements were, uh, they left a very, very lasting impact. And uh, I have the benefit of hindsight because now it's 15 years and I can talk about a lot of things, right? Rather than building a story, right? I can talk about a real story about what has happened over the last 15 years, what's transpired. And here's where it uh, turned out to be. I mean, my, the moment I came back from XLRI, I was fortunate to uh, start business with my best friend and uh, we were, were doing business together. We we're doing m consulting for the last 15 years, to almost 14 years now uh, together. And I think we're building it brick by brick. And, uh, you know, it's about, uh, we are t- running a team of 26 people right now. 
and uh, i think uh, somewhere a lot of things which were missed out in the global consulting firms those are the kind of practices those are the kind of exposures we are trying to build in house at in our firm to ensure that uh, you know the learnings are maximum and uh, we add as much value as we can for every assignment and engagement we take with clients so uh, that's broadly on the uh, you know my journey till now and uh, you know a couple of things if you want me to cover about what investment banking is what valuations is what is due diligence i can briefly touch upon it for a two a minute or two and then maybe we can get into specific questions right is that okay all right so uh, as fancy as it may sound sally uh, you know even even i was i found it very very fancy when i was doing my uh, when i was doing my ca about this whole concept of investment banking as it used to there was a time when it used to be called merchant banking investment banking yeah. corporate finance you know these are very very fancy words mna consultancy you know and i was always you know uh, very uh, blown over by such uh, you know fancy words and i said you know i think uh, i want to be a high flying uh, person and i want to get into something like uh, consulting right and especially in mna related consulting and uh, so that that was a uh, you know a dream and desire of a 23 year old uh, you know trying to see you know what change we can do right and of course one thing i was uh, i knew at that point in time that uh, um, i'd rather be part of an organization which is small and make a larger impact rather than being part of a very large organization and make a minimal impact right so that was pretty uh, i was clear about that and and i was again fortunate that i had my co-founder also with similar uh, thought process and that's when we joined hands and he said hey you know what it's great we're doing entrepreneurship it's definitely risky uh, we started when lehman brothers collapsed 2009 and uh, there was absolute uh, you know the market was at at the lowest as at at what it can be and uh, so we said you know let's let's still try and create an impact right and that's why we slowly built it out and um, and it, uh what really we started off with uh, sali you know today we might talk about you know working on 200 300 transactions till now but of course there are always these initial 3 to 5 years of struggle right uh, whenever we do uh, we get into consulting because the first question a client will ask you is what's your experience right and uh, then you again come back to the chicken and egg story right hey you know what unless you give me some work how can i tell somebody else that i've worked in this particular domain right? how did you be- so break the circle <laughs> uh so honestly the way we broke the circle was uh we did ended up doing quite a few works for minimal cost or even free of cost right we said give us that give us an opportunity right i'm not going to charge you right i mean that's 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 the best i can do right and i give you we'll we'll do the best of work right for you and that's where a few clients started building confidence then there were some previous relationships we had you know we said that just throw in work at us and we'll we'll just do it and you can decide the price later you can decide the value later you can decide everything later so that's i think those initial struggles right where we actually get into these elements of uh, uh, you know how do you break that chicken and egg uh, story not not everybody has to go through that but i think we were too young and uh, you know we had to go through that uh, that kind of pain it's really so, have uh, this trap <laughs> it does it does so in terms of m and a if i have to explain right uh, so of course there is uh, uh, anybody who has uh, an analytical mindset right somebody who can see through something which looks beautiful right i think uh, see through see through trends without really getting into excel sheets just look at the uh, financials and have that you know initial gut you know that something doesn't look right you know and then something i need to look more and then actually go more deeper and then understand uh, you know break away from where the stream is flowing right if people have that mindset i think consulting or for for the matter m and a advisory is something which i would uh, recommend uh, if people want to do and number two i think more importantly a lot of people uh, need to be aware of is that uh, uh, m and a consulting is also a lot of uh, uh, a lot of soft skills required right in terms of talking to people uh, reading through uh, body language understanding what your client is requiring understanding where you know a particular buyer or a seller will break understanding you know where is that you think that there's a bridge for a value so all of those things right so it is one thing is definitely what we learn through numbers the other thing is a lot of this emotional element right so then i could say the iq plus eq right both need to be very strong to be in a consulting business right because at the end of the day you have to understand that in a consulting business a client comes to you with a problem and you can't just keep talking about the problem and he comes to you with the problem because he wants a solution from you right and and that's what it is right i mean you you understand and you give them that confidence you know that maybe you don't have the you may not have the answer right away 
So it's not like you're taking an interview and you have to give the best answer to him right away, right? You have to just build that confidence in him that, hey, you know what? You have a problem and I understand your problem and we'll get to a solution and we'll get to a right, uh, you know, uh, element where you, when we'll be able to address your issue. So I think investment acting is, is that, uh, like I said, uh, and of course, there is a lot of painful process of research and a lot of painful process of not very exciting things about uh, you know, uh, calling up people, trying to find out some basic, uh, you know, Google searching and, you know, database hunting and hundreds of other things, which is very, very monotonous and extremely boring. But of course, if you see light at the end of the tunnel, that how much impact you make when you close a transaction, if people have that wherewithal to actually stay through a transaction for a year, two years, sometimes three years, it takes to close a transaction. If somebody has that patience and to work in a very unstructured environment, right? So it's not like, you're giving an audit checklist that these are the 10 things and you tick mark each of them and then you're fine. You do your audit report and sign it off. This is a very, very unstructured environment. And if people are excited about, you know, thinking in, in an unstructured environment, not a lot of people have that mindset, no, that plus you have to be a people person. It is important that you know, understand emotions, understand people, understand pain points. And of course the analytical mindset goes without saying, right? I mean, that's the reason why, uh, you know, we excel in, uh, m &A advisory, right? We as in the, uh, C, the CA community, whoever gets into investment banking. So, so that's broadly what it is. And uh, if, I, if I want to just touch upon a little bit about valuation, uh, whatever, uh, Sally, we uh, learn uh, as valuation, right? In theory, right? Uh, it is good for uh, clearing exams. Uh, at the end of the day, it's very uh, simple. Uh, what is value, right? It is purely something where you have a willing buyer and a willing seller shaking hands on something, right? That is the real value, right? And a lot of thing, a uh, lot of times, uh, the value is really dependent on who is more desperate, right? If the buyer is more desperate, the value goes up. If the seller is more desperate, the value goes down. So it's primarily that, right? I mean, of course, I mean, we can always build logic behind it, try to create a lot of science behind it. Let's build a discounted cash flow. Let's do comparable multiples. At the end of the day, even if you look at comparing multiples of 25 deals, you know, the range which you'll be looking at will be somewhere between three to 25 X, right? And then you come somewhere to a, uh, to a median using a bell curve, right? But at the end of the day, you, uh, people also have to understand that there are deals which have happened in the similar space at three times also. And there are deals which have happened in the similar space at 25 times also, right? So, so that's, that's really what, what valuation is, right? If I have to put it in a nutshell, right? In terms of what investment banking is, what mergers and acquisitions is, what, uh, valuation is. And of course, another element is due diligence. And we do more of financial due diligence. And that is to, even if companies have done audits, right, there's a reason to do financial diligence, to understand more of, uh, you know, one line, if I have to explain what is due diligence, I think it is to make the investor or the buyer understand the sustainability of the business, right, whether it is in terms of the profitability, or whether it is in terms of the asset quality, right. So primarily that is what you give a judgment on, right? Through a lot of analysis, that's what financial diligence is. So broadly that's on the work side uh, and uh, happy to take any specific questions. Ali. I hope I was not too long. Uh, no, that, that was really required because as a fresher, when I, when I heard such word, okay, mergers and acquisition. So I'm not really sitting in the table doing this mergers and acquisition. There's, there's a back end. Like, there's a lot more, uh, you know, number crunching, uh, there are some escrows, representations, target indemnification. Then there are several and joint liabilities. Then there, there are closing conditions. There's so many things like, you know, we need to understand this financial statement. So I need, to, so thank you for breaking that myth that, okay, m and is like, you are directly going there and doing this m and You, I mean, as a fresher, I'm sorry. I mean, that is not something that you would uh, be able to get in but huh of course you will get through it once you get into the back-end work and then you understand and um, you know kind of improvise on your acumen that how it really uh, being shaped up so that's that's really on uh, merchants and acquisitions and so what you were take would be uh, Darshan that you know as a student yeah fair we are like young members what should we really uh, try inculcating in ourselves in order to get such kind of roles or where do you think there is a miss or it shouldn't have been done or it should have been done what is that so Penny for your thoughts please understood so uh, Sally let me just uh, put it again I like to talk with uh, you know, real examples, right? Rather than being very uh, uh, philosophical about, uh, you know, any particular question being asked, right? 
so let me uh, you know step back in terms of when we take uh, interviews right when we are actually interviewing people um so uh, you know interestingly we are always excited to work with a lot of fresh blood right we are not really looking at people especially with experience and uh, you know uh, sally even if somebody comes with a background experience in let's say investment banking or financial diligence or valuation also for that matter uh you know you'll be surprised in none of our interviews none of our interviews are anything technical or their understanding of what investment banking or mergers and acquisitions is or valuations or diligence see because that's something which i'm going to teach you right so you know you will learn they'll be learning on the job and all of them there's a team of 26 you know everybody's had different experiences they'll they'll obviously they'll be lot of learning on the job what really is lacking sally uh in terms of whenever we are taking interviews right uh, most of the times what we've seen is that people miss out on the most basic concepts and that's what is very disheartening right in the whole rush of uh, you know clearing exams right we have see that you know there is so much of the way the education is actually getting shaped up right it's about how do you crack your ca exams right and i've seen it over the last 20 years right i mean i i was doing my ca classes i started when in 2002 right it was 20 years back and i see uh, there were i i think in in pune there were one or two classes of chartered accountancy right which were popular and uh, what you see today it's like a cutthroat competition you you see buses actually there are advertisements on the buses right in terms of you know ki aap ca exam crack karna hai to you know come to me Right. So I mean, of course, there's a reason to that, right? There is definitely a lot of market and all of that, right? And I'm not criticizing or uh, appreciating any aspect, right? But my point is, in the whole, uh, and see, the, the professor is also doing something with an objective, right? It's important that people clear the CA exams. I'm not denying that that's not important, but students need to understand that uh, a very critical element is also about not losing understanding of your basics. and uh, when we uh, sally even chartered accountants with even 3 year experience if they come to us for an interview you'll be surprised our first question is on the pnl balance sheet and cash flow we just put that out i mean a pnl and a balance sheet and we just ask them to read through the pnl balance sheet and just comment on the operating cash flow of that business right just as simple as that that's the first question and unfortunately sally the uh, it can't get more basic than pnl balance sheet and cash flow right with somebody with a 3 year ca experience right absolutely I, mean, i second if that. i have to go if if i have to go more basic i have to go into general entries and uh, you know uh, but uh, we are not doing accounting job right we are doing we are chartered accountants right so now uh, you know sally you will be surprised three out of five chartered accountants are not able to answer something as basic as cash flow statements how do you actually end up coming into a cash flow statement now that is something which is which disappoints us and if i have to give you some statistics right uh, we whenever we open up a, a you know a, a vacancy right in our firm and uh, we typically get uh, about 50 to 60 applications for a particular vacancy and uh, because of xyz questions we ask uh, we probably end up shortlisting about 20 25 out of them uh, our first line team uh, they do interviews about these 15 20 people and uh, 20 25 people and then probably give us web and i we end up taking interviews about four or five typically out of these five we end up finding one candidate uh you know worthy of coming in and the reason again is sally we are not trying to ask people anything about mergers and acquisitions or uh you know or valuations right no no question is asked about what are the different approaches what is international value standards what are the methodologies how will you value intangible assets see all of this can be theoretically read through right but if a person has common sense and if a person understands basic reading of financial statements is absolutely something which is like a it's a, it's a it's a no go right if somebody cannot read through a simple financial statements it's an absolute no go forget about how i can train you right if you cannot get to your basics so that is the statistics i'm talking about out of 60 i end up getting one candidate and it is purely i'm telling you sally we just try to understand on the basic most basic concepts my second question is always to people on working capital and what's their understanding of working capital right people are not able to differentiate between what is a positive working capital and negative working capital can you imagine now that is so that that's what makes you feel question right ki why is it happening the way it is happening right why and right. Uh, so, that, so what were you doing at that day 
no no of course required. yeah so there's all ga- gana bajana uh, atmosphere will not help you in your professional life that is that is the strong message exactly. uh, you know what that shan i mean what i can derive it from his conversation that you know you can't be just casual about it ki ha ho jayega no i mean it is as basic as as he said it is as basic as getting your getting your facts right getting understand that uh, again he is telling he is not going deep dive or granular level about what is mna what is this he is just expecting from us that you know we have to have some basic understanding read through it you know romancing with balance sheet is what we always call and if you are not doing that then it's, it's it's something is really alarming right and that's the reason why we have such sessions so that it is it is like whistle blower for them that whatever they are doing in their student life or they are about to become a member or something so what what aspects they really need to fine tune with it is there it is just about you know uh, making it more uh, effective or making it more relatable is is what i think darshan so and and uh, that's that's about it and darshan i really want to know more about this non movement which you started and what is it about and uh, and your startup stint right so i i am sure you have more than 10 or 12 startup stints like provilag is one one uh, that i am aware of so tell us about that how how did you find it uh, so you know uh, To, to in order to get into invested or something that sort so sure. to so see uh sali uh you know another i think just a short message right uh, in terms of investments you, you know we uh, we've seen through uh, three ups and down cycles of the stock market right over the last 15 20 years right now uh i think another short message if if it's uh, if it's palatable right to the to the audience say right uh we see a lot of excitement of uh, the young generation uh, of making quick money right and uh, you know it's uh, people need to understand that luck plays such a big factor in life in every single time in life i think that generally comes only after they go through a cycle of two decades i think that's when they realize the importance of luck right now uh, not just in investments right in in general in life right i mean i think uh, there is a lot of element of luck which people tend to uh, overlook people who actually end up getting lucky uh, get overconfident and people who actually do not get that luck tend to actually under undermine themselves now uh, so i personally feel that if people are interested in stock markets it's important that then they build their career in stock markets right not because it's very easy to get carried away where somebody that because of whatsapp and all of these things right somebody is putting on whatsapp all the time hammering hey you know what i picked up the stock and it's gone up 20% upper circuit upper circuit every single day and then there is fear of missing out right hey you know what i should have picked up the stock and then they end up picking up the stock where it's already overvalued you look at what happened to irctc right you look at what happened to so many other stocks right i mean i i can't pick up you know there is i think i can talk about 20 other stocks like these right now that is something which people need to avoid right if they want to do stock market investment right build your career in that right because that is where you require 24/7 attention right to lot of elements right uh, not the fundamentals also but on the technical side as well in terms of how i look at investments uh, so uh, see one is my investments are mostly through mutual funds because i think i'm a very very lazy investor so i do not want to care about timing the market i do not want to care about ups and downs i am not an expert in uh, investments even if to do merger and acquisition people think that if you are into mna you are an expert in stock picking and it's an absolutely wrong assumption people have i make all my investments through mutual funds for number one uh number two if i am at all making investments in startups like you mentioned so sali i have a very simple criteria so i also see we all learn the hard way right we failures and you know bad uh, experiences are important in life because they teach you a lot of things so uh i've uh, burned uh, a lot of uh, money in in this entire fomo concept of uh, startup investments as well so uh, personally speaking i have 12 uh, 10 startups which i had invested in they were most of them were from iit mumbai iit bombay uh, the founder uh, the founder was from iit bombay and of course in the whole uh, fire of you know let's invest because somebody else is also investing uh, in that uh, excitement invested in uh, the such 10 startups and all of them today is the value is absolute zero having said that what my learning from this entire concept is right that it's not like i'm going to be completely negative about it right what i learned is this that 
so there is two types of investors, right? A lot of people say that you know you should invest in twelve, ten, or fifteen, twenty startups, and usme say one startup will give you hundred x returns, right? Well, there are people who make money out of that also, but I am of the opinion, and I like to make investments where I know the founders personally, right? I know the founders personally, and I can have some influence in his way of thinking, and he's responsible to me, right? So that's my very very clear criteria. I'd rather put. uh you know if i have a basket of 10 for investment i'd rather put six in a particular investor uh, in a particular startup where i know the founder personally and i can i'm not saying i'll influence but i can get real time feedback from him right and if at all there is a need for some corrective action the promoter is open enough to have that conversation with me so my uh, uh so my business also gives me access to a lot of uh, uh you know entrepreneurs who have built businesses solid businesses right 100 crore 1000 crore 2000 crores and there is more lot of them also end up doing ipos at a point in time so my preferred investments are of course there is one portion of equity which you invest through mutual funds and the other preferred portion for me on investment is invest in startups where you know the promoters you understand the business so i'll not, i'll not invest in a startup which is you know into robotic automation or something right because i just don't understand I don't understand which, if that guy is talking a five-year-old technology or he's talking about the latest technology. Right? I have absolutely no clue about it. I'll invest in a, in a startup which I understand the business and I know the promoters. Or number two, I'll invest in any preferential allot, preferential allotment if I get an opportunity for any of my clients, you know, where they have opened it for friends and family, and you know, if there is an exposure I can get to take, where I can make an exit during the IPO. So these are, I think, uh, because again, I, the other good part over there is. you automatically become long term investors right because daily you don't you don't have the worry of you know a daily stock track uh, stock uh, rate right of those uh, particular investments so that's that's broadly on the investment side and uh, uh, you talked about non movement right yeah so uh, let me touch upon a little bit about what non movement is uh, very frankly uh, not trying to take any credit in terms of starting a movement or anything taking small little steps which uh, uh, you know a couple of things in life which have shaped us right and uh, fortunate to be uh, born in a uh, you know in a particular uh, uh, i would say in a particular culture where uh, you know there were there were three elements since childhood have been very influential on me and uh, of course with this experience of excel i mentioned right on the social element right i think that it's a combination of a couple of things right and you realize that uh, uh, you know uh, one of the things which i when i started discussing right saying that it is never too late to start something and also it's never too early to start something as well right so we cannot really think about uh, you know giving back to the society in a particular way when only when we turn 60 years old right i mean suddenly when you realize that you've done everything and then you realize a lot of it is you know for no reason right i mean you'll end up losing out on relationships you end up losing out on so many other things right so uh, so as, as a child right i mean being born in a jain family right uh, the philosophy of jainism three elements of that which uh, you know influenced me a lot and obviously this is not a religious sermon right but it's about uh, uh, you know uh, it's about the philosophy of uh, ahinsa anekantwa then aparigraha right if i have to explain so what is ahinsa is i think everybody understands i think gandhi ji made it very popular in fact a lot of what uh, he popularized he was also influenced by a, a very very uh, a uh, very influential jain monk when uh, gandhi ji was in gujarat and um, so ahinsa that element a lot of the non violence element came out of that so uh, not that i'm taking any credit of india's independence because of jainism but uh, i'm just saying you know that non violence is the basic tenet on which uh, jainism uh, uh, you know it's uh, uh, the philosophy of jainism not really the religion jainism right it is based on uh the other element is anekantwad uh, which is uh, multiplicity of opinions so if i have to uh, see how the world is now adopting uh, anekantwad is uh, let's look at the way we are all talking about diversity diversity and inclusion right dni dni there's so much of discussion around it now what is dni right uh, just step back dni is nothing but anekantwad right looking at it from everybody's uh, perspective right one perspective which we have uh, so let me let me put it up with an example right i think a lot of people would have heard about this beautiful story about uh, six blind men and an elephant right so imagine six blind uh, men are touching different parts of an of an elephant and if you ask them to describe right the person who will touch uh, you know the tail will talk that it's a snake the person who will touch the foot uh, the, the foot he might say that it's a, it's a 
it's a tree right the person who touches uh, you know the years will say that it's a, it's a fan the earlier fans which is to have right so each one is right in his own way right uh, and uh, that's his or her perspective now what anekantwad really says is that uh, it's everybody has a particular view and there is nothing wrong or right everybody is giving a view from their point of view and i think what diversity and inclusion really comes about is something similar to this right we have to be empathetic we have to empathize with uh, you know not sympathize with people and their uh, issues but show empathy in terms of uh, you know going in the other person's shoe and seeing what problem or issue they are facing and try to see if you can get to a solution about it so so that's anekantwa then of course the third one is aparigraha is about non materialism of course it's easy to just talk about fancy words but if you see there's a lot of trend going on about uh, minimal living minimalism you know in the west and all of that right so They is that a is that a is that a reason for the grey shirt? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Uh, well, yes. So one of the things which I've thought of adopting, making life a little simpler, is uh, wearing only grey shirts so that uh, you know you don't have to really uh, waste more time uh, shopping. Uh, I'm not saying I have to wear something. Uh, I don't want to be an ascetic, of course, because my profession will not allow me that. But I need not wear fancy shirts to make myself feel good about. every single day right so that's a way of actually try to control uh, materialism in in a particular manner so these are the elements right uh, and the non movement is to do with that it's nothing which i have started or anything it's just trying to build some awareness around it and i don't want it to be a movement which i have started or it it's just something which i uh, you know want to be a catalyst to spread this as much as we can and uh, see that there is more and more adoption towards it so so that's something which uh, yeah i'm a little passionate about and uh, So talking about passions you know i uh, it will not be completed we need to talk about cycle we need to talk about marathon we need to talk about baby eva is she's just 7 years old people and i'm sure 12 plus more treks she must have done by now and she has run uh, marathon with right with him traveled some 1000 kilometers with him i mean please you let let it just be from you <laughs> right so uh so one of the elements uh, you know i uh, like i said see luck plays a big factor right and i, th- I think it's important that people do understand and appreciate these uh, elements in life right i think one of the big luck we have in life is uh, i think my father uh, and my mother also i mean in a lot of ways right they've sacrificed so much because obviously they lived life in absolute uh, minimal environment right and i think we i find myself extremely fortunate with the fact that there is so much which is readily available uh, you know from uh, uh, from what my parents actually gave sacrifices on right now i think the one element which i always longed for and i missed out was i felt that my uh, my folks did not spend enough time with me right and that's one of the key element which i thought you know at least my daughter should not feel you know that uh, you know i i haven't had the time when my father had the energy right see it's no point in spending time when i'm 60 years old with my daughter and she's excited and i say you know what i think i don't think i'm of that particular energy levels right so uh, with that uh, uh, you know uh, eva uh, interestingly early on i'm a pretty outdoor person i like running outside i love doing marathons i think it just frees up uh, that's my way of meditation very frankly you know so uh, unfortunately i've not been able to sit quietly and you know learn meditation but for me meditation comes when i'm out and i'm running and and you know that my thoughts are very very streamlined uh, so to say and i saw the uh, the beauty of that right it, it helps uh, in a lot of elements at work so uh, so running like i said uh, started off with all of this and then slowly slowly built my uh, you know interest in cycling long distance cycling uh, uh, you know so started with in 2009 i went for a 1000 km cycling over 6 days uh, you know across the entire forest of nilgiris so uh, you know so what i like about these things right uh, fitness and uh, you know even reading for that matter i think these elements right when you're traveling also they open up so much of perspectives for us right and again going back to the philosophy right anekantwad it's important that we understand perspectives and i think these elements all come together put together i think it just make us more uh, humble in terms of uh, not be arrogant about what we achieve not be arrogant about uh, you know what we have because you know tomorrow something might just go wrong and we might just have nothing left right so make the most of the present moment and uh, you know somewhere there is also one of the books i read about stoicism uh, if people are interested in reading there's a beautiful book by marcus aurelius 
uh, it's called meditations uh, and i think it talks about stoicism and uh, how you know a roman emperor actually ended up uh, managing a chaotic roman empire uh, through stoicism right so uh, so elements like these right it just makes you realize that there is so much more you are not aware of there is so much more in this world which you do not know and i think that's where you know the entire desire every single day to come out and learn more things and learn more and do more right so it's not like after 20 years of experience you know i feel that you know you know i'm like uh, you know the the go to person for anything i think every single day from every young element every young person i interact with there is so much more to learn so i like the energy levels uh, but i just feel that the energy needs to channelize properly so uh, so with eva uh, you know she's done uh, you know sally uh, 35 tracks till now uh, so yeah and uh, so uh, she is pretty much uh, you know and a very very enthusiastic avid trekker for the last 3 years she's been we've been trekking very very regularly and uh, she also loves the outdoors and uh, this last december we also ended up uh, you know doing a a beautiful 1200 km motorcycling across the mountains of uh, uttarakhand and uh, i was fortunate enough for my daughter also to be excited to sit on the motorcycle with me and we did she didn't do the entire 1200 kilometers with me but about 2 300 kilometers she was sitting through and we had the joy of uh, spending time just with each other right and i think i think that also is very very meditative to me uh, time spending with my daughter also is extremely meditative so and that, that, that's that's when i said yeah. where are you taking her it, it, that <laughs> temperature and they say you know what it's just 1200 kilometers i said what <laughs> so, yeah. and that that's how you know i is i'm just inarticulate i cannot put up put up in in the words that what I, what i have been derived oh, throughout this conversation definitely this one is for my keepsakes i'll keep on listening to more and more and you know such conversations people so that was all about darshan that not really one part of this is you are what you are seeing it's just the tip of the iceberg there's so much uh, more with him i would love to bring him on the platform on and off we will talk more about so now now you must have you know got it right there a plethora of knowledge we cannot cover it in like just 30 30 40 minutes so darshan i had a great 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 time conversing with you and there are so many aspects so many elements that we've touched based on and um, anything like you know the ending note that you would like to share with us i think uh, one of the uh, not that i thought through this but uh, one of the things which i always uh, uh, you know use in my own life right we see everybody goes through a lot of ups and downs and sometimes we have mentors to actually guide us through a, a painful element or a very exciting element right and i'm very very influenced by this one particular statement which says uh, this too shall pass and uh, you know the beauty of this statement is that you can use this statement even in a an absolute low time in your life and you can use this statement in an absolute high time in your life so when you are not say for example if somebody is not cleared their ce exams all they have to think about is this too shall pass right and not be so upset and you know make this as a big deal out of it and the same statement can be if somebody is coming out with absolute flying colors first rank everything all india ranking you know the moment again if you look at the statement this too shall pass you know just don't stay in a high moment right this will also pass and you have to again get ready for more struggles in life so so that's that's if if, if that helps in a ending note uh, i'd like to end with that yeah i how i feel that this this shouldn't be passed like it, it should be there we should keep talking to you like that so yes that was a beautiful note to uh, wrap up the session and thank you so much for being here uh, it's it was thank an you, absolute Sally. pleasure and so knowledgeable like you know every sentence make made me think oh really yes i mean so back in i i was on mute but yes i was affirming nodding yes yeah absolutely right <laughs> so like, that was the beauty of it right so thank you once again and uh, people i'll see you in the next episode with such versatile personalities where you can get so much of energy and inspire inspiring stories so stay tuned and we shall meet on the next episode thanks thank you